Okay, in this video I'm going to cover hardware security modules or HSMs. But before I get into that, I want to jump back to an earlier part of my career and that was when I was dealing with physical security. This really introduced me into some of the challenges that are out there and some of the solutions that can help you better your security. Um, I did learn that managing secrets is extremely hard um, and here's one of those examples. Um, a lot of the safes that you'll go to uh, will have a combination lock on the outside and now uh, sometimes they have digit pads that you can type in a code uh, but most of the safes will have a dial the challenge with that dial is the numbers can be seen from a distance um, an adversary if they uh, put a dot on the dial they can see it from a distance of where the dial is being spun at so even if you covered up part of the dial there's a possibility that you could be leaking out um, the code that you use to unlock the safe. So hardware to the rescue. Uh, here we have two examples of hardware that was uh, created to help with this uh, exploit. And these are the Mass Hamilton. Uh, there's an X09 and an X07 uh, combination lock. And what was really unique about these locks was there were no numbers on the outside. The numbers were provided to you on uh, an LCD screen at the top that the person standing over the lock was the only one that had visibility of it. Um, this was great because every time that dial, the first time it was spun, the zero position was reset every single time. Uh, there was a lot of other protective measures that were put in place to prevent adversaries from getting access to it. But I thought it was a really great example of how hardware can come and uh, help uh, increase the security. That's related to physical security. So if we jump to cybersecurity and we start looking at our laptops, our desktops, our mobile devices, there's already security modules that are here. And I bring these up because they do relate to HSMs, um, but I want to point out what they are compared to HSMs. So you may or may not know, but most computers will come with a TPM. This is called a trusted platform module. It's either soldered uh, onto the motherboard of the computer, or it could be a daughter board as shown here. A lot of servers will have uh, additional uh, daughter boards as, as well to be able to help them uh, in this area. Uh, mobile devices will have this area called the trusted execution environment. This is where a lot of applications can uh, conduct certain operations in this, what's considered a secure area uh, to be able to execute um, different code operations that need to be done in a secure area and provide it back to the application. What are HSMs for then? If we have these TPMs and we have these TEs, and uh, why do we need HSMs? Well, an HSM is a dedicated cryptographic processor device that safeguards digital artifacts and performs secure cryptographic operations. Couple keywords here, dedicated. This is a dedicated piece of hardware in your environment. Uh, the only job that this device does is cryptographic safeguarding and cryptographic operations. And that's key to know compared to a TPM, which is a part of an operating system that it's a chip that is there to support the operating system that's around it. Um, the HSM is a device that allows you to perform the cryptographic operations inside the device. Now, I want to make sure that it's understood. This is not just simply a cryptographic storage device. You're not just storing data inside of it. Uh, that's not what an HSM, uh, HSM's real value of the digital, that, which is important. But what's important is the operations that can be done inside of it. So let's talk about the different types of HSMs that are out there. I put this, these three categories together myself. There's uh, probably different ways to slice and dice this. This is the way that I look at it. Your first HSM that you're going to see usually is an infrastructure HSM. These are rack mounted devices that perform a lot of operations per second. They're going to be doing those cryptographic operations. They have storage on them. Uh, they're, they're very high throughput devices. I'll get into some use cases where this will be more apparent of, of how you would use a device like this um, in just a little bit here. 
But the next HSM that you'll come across, and this has been coming out the last few years, is the cloud HSM. Now these are HSMs, that are, it's a service provided by a cloud vendor. Uh, multiple cloud vendors out there do provide some sort of uh, uh, HSM. Um, the key with this for me personally, and this is my opinion, um, there's a saying in the cryptocurrency world, not your keys, not your crypto. Um, when you're talking about the sensitivity of your secret keys for your organization, this is your organization's identity. It's, it's, it's critical to the organization. Um, personally, I would guide my organizations away from using cloud HSM and having some kind of infrastructure HSM on hand to be able to protect those. Now there's a third category of HSMs and that's the portable HSMs. Now these are devices that could look like a uh, external USB drive uh, sitting on your desktop. It could be, uh, as I'll talk a little bit later, uh, look like a YubiKey, but it's actually a, a UBHSM. Uh, there's also PCI cards that you can plug into a computer. Um, I put that here as portable, even though I don't think you're popping it out every time moving to another system, uh, but it's a very small form factor device that can uh, add that HSM capability to existing hardware that you have in your infrastructure. So I had to put it in some category and I figured I'd put it in the portable HSM. So let's talk about some use cases that you might come across for uh, using an HSM because I think that's important if you're just learning about HSMs, where, where could you see them being used at in an organization? This is not all encompassing. It's not gonna cover every use case that's out there. It's just a few that I've personally come across in my career. So use case one is gonna be SSL, SSL offloading. Um, and what happens with an organization is they usually start uh, one server, they got their website up, they're happy-go-lucky people. Business starts taking off, they're starting to get a lot of hits on the server. What do they do? They add multiple servers into their infrastructure and they introduce what's called a load balancer to get in front of it. And they're feeling pretty good about themselves. And they should, you know, your organization's growing, applications are being used, that's great news. So then you start to expand out your load balancers. So now you have clustered load balancers, you have global load balancers, you have local load balancers. There's a lot of different ways to slice and dice uh, the infrastructure. But what ends up happening is your load balancers start getting very overworked. They have a lot of traffic that they're pushing through. All the traffic that's coming through, uh, a lot of it's probably SSL. So for them to know where to route that traffic to, they need to decrypt the traffic with the SSL certificate. So it becomes very burdensome for them. So what you do in this case is you add some HSMs into the environment. And this is where your load balancers can offload that work to those HSMs. As you can see here, the different load balancers, what they would do is the traffic would come in, they'd send that traffic off to the HSM to be decrypted, come back, and then they know where to route the traffic. And then when the traffic returns back to the requesting client, the HSM would encrypt the traffic before the load balancer uh, sends it back to the user. Uh, so this is a typical environment. This is the first time that I personally came across HSMs was to offload from our load balancers that we had. Now use case number two is infrastructure management. Um, this is another area that is uh, benefits greatly from uh, HSMs. Um, one of the companies that I worked for was uh, managing infrastructure hardware with automation. And we had a management server and we had different servers that were under management that we called minions. Um, the way that these minions communicated to the master and they authenticated was with a public and private key pair. Uh, they, they stored those keys locally on uh, their, their hard disk and that's the way that they authenticated to the master. One of the challenges though is what happens if somebody gets a hold of those keys and they start to impersonate um, one of the servers in the environment. That is a challenge. So this is where you can introduce an HSM as well to where those minions would actually store their keys on the HSM 
their, their private keys and the adversary, even if they got a hold of the file system on, um, on the network there, they wouldn't be able to access the HSM. And you can have other measures in place to per prevent that adversary from getting access to those keys. But this is just another use case that you could see an HSM in. Use case number three, uh, this is for build servers. This is another customer that I was working with. Um, what they had was they had a VM ESX server that had multiple Windows boxes. Uh, I think it was 2016 server. And their only purpose was to build the binaries and digitally sign it for the company. Um, the artifacts that they generated so they would have code signing done on these servers. The problem that they had with this was, again, they needed to keep the secret key on every individual box uh, that was building this software. And they didn't like the fact that they had so many different boxes um, that is a part of their attack surface that had the private keys on it. And they were really worried because with code signing, especially this customer, this was extremely important. This again comes to the, the company's identity. And if someone can sign code with your private key um, and impersonate you as a company, they can take advantage of your company. This is reputation damage, uh, lack of confidence in the software build process. There's, there's a lot of failures that happen here. And there's a lot of exploits out there uh, in this particular area. So one of the solutions here is you could spin up another VM. In this case, we spun up an Ubuntu box. We had the HSM, the UBHSM plugged into the ESXi server, mapped over to that independent VM that it could do the code signing with that HSM. And the rest of those build servers would talk to that HSM uh, server to digitally sign their code. So they would build the artifact, send the signature in to be digitally signed, and then they would wrap that up and, and send it out as a package. Uh, so that was one uh, use case there. Uh, use case number four, this is gonna be a little bit different. Um, it, it may I'm gonna do my best to describe all the nuances here, but I think this is a, a very good use case as well for uh, especially portable HSMs. I think this is one of the best use cases for portable HSMs. Let's say your organization has this secret and it's extremely important. You don't use it all the time. This is a, maybe it's a private key for something uh, that you're using, uh, but it's an extremely important secret. Well, in this case, you could create an AES key and you can encrypt that secret. So now you have an encrypted, um, you have the secret encrypted, so you're good there, but what do you do with that key? How do you, uh, control that AES key that was used. Uh, it's a symmetric key, so you could use that to decrypt. In this case, what you could do is you could create another AES key. And with that AES key, you can encrypt the first AES key. So now you have the second, which is an orange, AES key that is used to decrypt the original secret key that you have then you go that final step and the final step is taking that aes key and splitting it up or sharding it out and putting it on to different hsms and you can take those hsms and you could globally disperse them throughout uh, your organization wherever you have people located throughout the world and you could give them a portable hsm that contains a part of that aes secret along with the actual encrypted secret. So they don't have the full complete AES key to decrypt it, but they have a part of it. So nobody in the organization has the full key and you need to get everyone together to be able to restore that key. Now this isn't, um, this isn't something like Samara secret sharing or M of N. Um, this is really just sharding a uh, string uh, for an AES key to multiple keys. Now you could put some other uh, mechanisms in here, but this is one way that you could um, shard off those secrets. So to wrap it up, and this was a quick video, quick overview, um, I really hope that this helped. 
uh, just to give an idea of what HSMs can be used for, some of the use cases that are out there. Uh, I do plan on putting out a few more videos. There's a couple that I'm going to focus on for the UBHSM and some additional use cases. Uh, I'll go over um, storing your API keys for Amazon uh, on an HSM and how you, you would use that with your portable HSM. Uh, in this case, I'm going to be using the UBHSM through all my demos and you'll be able to get a better understanding of how to use the HSM in your environment. Uh, so again, I hope that this helped. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please put them down below and uh, I will answer them as soon as I can. Thank you.